Great, so welcome back everybody. We've got an exciting session on trade and manufacturing this morning. Uh, we're gonna have 20 minutes for each uh, presenter, 15 minutes discussion, and then we'll keep the Q&A to the end and have about 20 minutes Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Laura Alfaro, who's the Warren Alpert Professor of Business Administration at, at Harvard Business School. Over to you, Laura. Okay, um, first let me thank uh, the organizers for this invitation. I don't know if you noticed, you have a disproportional share of the Costa Rican and Uruguayan economists <laughs> in your program, but I checked the numbers. I think Costa Rica is uh, winning by one person uh, who's a student at Princeton. So anyways, so thanks. This is a co-author work with Alejandro Cunyat, uh, Harold, and Yan Ping. And it's very much work in progress, so comments welcome. So let me start with some general motivation. Um, so after the global financial crisis, there was a renewed debate on real exchange rate movements, uh, part motivated in emerging markets by the massive uh, capital flows that uh, relate to quantitative easing and the policies implemented in rich countries to solve the problems they created. And so, for example, Mantega, the uh, Minister of Finance in Brazil, was uh, famous for many weird things, but one of them is that he coined the uh, currency wars uh, term and was uh, very vocal, uh, criticizing about potential effects real exchange rate uh, appreciations could have in manufacturing. It turns out this also became a topic in rich countries. I think uh, the current president of the US uh, has talked a lot about it. But even yesterday, uh, the cover of the Financial Times uh, was discussing how the minutes of the European Central Bank, uh, they're worried about a strong dollar, that the US is gonna let go of the strong dollar policy and potential implications there. So because of that, uh, countries have also started to implement many uh, policies. I have a paper that in particular looks at the capital controls and reserve accumulation policies that Brazil trying to implement to prevent some of these exchange rate appreciation, perhaps not with uh, good results in general in Brazil. Um, but again, th there is a focus on the macro policies, but there has also been some renewed interest on some of the micro policies. And here Fabio Gironi has a very nice paper that is looking at some of the macro effects of anti-dumping and some other policies. It turns out these policies in general uh, do tend to violate WTO rules. Again, it may be that the current administration and the US doesn't care, but many of these more direct export and import uh, subsidies and tariffs do violate WTO. But unlike these trade policies, real exchange rate uh, changes do not violate WTO rules, and they also don't violate IMF rules. Uh, there is, the US likes to label countries currency manipulators, but the whole Bretton Woods system, the whole IMF was about countries fixing their exchange rate. So there is uh, nothing per se that in terms of these international institutions violates these policies. It, it goes against implementing these policies. We argue, however, that perhaps the effects of real exchange rates, depreciations and appreciations are far from clear, perhaps inconclusive. There is a extensive empirical work, and Danny Rodrigue has contributed to this literature, that has looked at some of the effects of real exchange rate depreciations. But we argue perhaps there is not con no consensus on the channels. I, I, some may go through externalities, some may go through large aggregate savings effects. I, and on the empirical side, there's always issues of omitted variables, reverse causalities. There's a nice discussion on this issue uh, about Woodford and Henry. On the other side, firm level studies are also uh, less available, in part because data uh, for a wide set of countries uh, was less or is harder to find. So this is what we do in this paper. In this paper, we investigate the effects of real exchange rate movements on productivity, and we exploit a, several comprehensive data sets that we have tried to put together. Every place I go, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, for data. I feel now like I'm like a hoarding data. So this is a compilation of data that includes economic activity, trade status, R&D, foreign currency uh, borrowing. Uh, 
So with this data, we start first at looking at some of the stylized facts. We find evidence of heterogeneous effects of real exchange rate movements. And we divide our data in three regions. We looked at, a, we put together our countries in Asia, Latin America, and, and Eastern Europe, and industrialized countries. Again, this is uh, to manage the, the information we have and also to deal with a more or less representation by certain countries. In most of our data sets, Africa, we just don't have enough information from Africa, so that's why we divide it in, in these three regions. So for emerging Asia, emerging Asia, we find that manufacturing, for manufacturing firms, and, and the analysis is focused on manufacturing firms, real exchange rate appreciations are associated with faster firm level TFP growth, and we measure it in a couple of ways, although we don't have unit uh, quantity, so, so we use the standard methods that take it from, from some of the values that we have, sales and cash flow growth. We also find that it's uh, associated with higher probability to engage in R&D and export. It's also mostly concentrated in exporting firms, and for importing firms, we find negative effects. When we look at Latin America and Eastern Europe, which we label other emerging countries, the effects, if anything, are negative, and for industrialized countries, we don't find significant effects, uh, signs flip, but, but again, most results are not significant. So we take these results and we're trying to understand some of the micro channels through which these effects come about. So we exploit structural differences in export and import orientation, financial development and borrowing in these three regions. We structurally estimate a dynamic firm level model of exporting, importing and R&D investment and the model features a market size effects through which real exchange of repreciations may lead to more demand in the model, it, it's isomorphic if you want, whether the, the firms are engaging in more exporting because they have higher demand or because in foreign currency, the cost is lower. Uh, and so we, we model it that way. We feature intermediate goods imports. Uh, and so there might be a decision to uh, switch for domestic uh, inputs or to go abroad for higher quality imports and decisions to invest, which are subject to financial constraints. We then decompose the TFP effects in the effects that are due to R&D, the effects that are due to higher demand, and the effects that are due to changes in import, and we quantify the importance of market size and financial constraints. We later take the model and we conduct some counterfactual simulations of exchange rate depreciations and appreciations. And we find that even short-lived real exchange rate movements can have persistent effects on TFP that come through these decisions to invest and innovate. And we also find that there are asymmetric and nonlinear effects between depreciations and appreciations. Again, this is related to the different export and import uh, orientations, capacity to substitute, and also some option value that comes from the sunk cost of R&D. And, and some of these results that we get, we back also from the data. Caveats, our analysis is going to be silent on welfare because we're not going to analyze where these real exchange rate appreciations come about. We're going to take them as given. And because of that, we cannot tell you anything about welfare. So far, we don't know if these are coming through reserve accumulation, inflation, financial repression. We also don't model if there is going to be tensions among countries and currency wars. So I, as I said, as, at this stage, we cannot talk about welfare. So the paper is uh, somewhat long, as I was told by that discussion. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So I'm going to skip the related literature, and so you can go to the paper and see your name cited. Uh, this paper does relate to different uh, literatures. The way we structure the paper is we first start with the reduced form empirical evidence, where we get our stylized facts. We use our stylized facts to inform our theoretical model. Then we present our empirical strategy. Then we uh, go about our empirical results, and then we take our model and simulate some counterfactuals in our model. So let me start by the data. So we use Orbis, which has, uh, a, was used a lot, especially its European brother Amadeus in a lot of work in finance and trade, and I think he is now coming 
also to international finance. This gives us a firm listed and unlisted firms. We get from this data sales, materials, capital stock, employees, cash flow, R&D expenditure. We concentrate in 201 to 10. So we're looking, if you want, at some normal times. <laughs> in fact, after Argentina and Uruguay and Brazil they misbehaved <laughs> a little bit in the early 2000s, there has been no emerging market crisis throughout this period. Um, and I, some of the robustness, we do take out the global financial crisis and we get similar results. We combine with a world base, Dun & Bradstreet, uh, an advantage of Dun & and Dun & Bradstreet and related to the discussion we had yesterday, it gives you better plant level information and better location where production is happening. So we combine these uh, data sources. Uh, for this data, I only have certain vintages, so we combine the data. For four countries, we have more detailed administrative data. So we use those countries, if you want, for us as a sanity check of some of the firm level data that we, we have. And so we have information on Colombia, France, uh, China, and Hungary. Then we also exploit the World Bank export dynamic database. The World Bank has actually compiled export and import data from custom data and actually is a very good source of export and import data. It turns out in particular Latin American countries, despite what people uh, say and think of us, we have been very good at collecting export and import data and it has <laughs> been compiling that uh, data source. I don't get royalties, but I actually recommend that it's a very good uh, source of uh, export and import data. For the real exchange rate, we use data from the Penn World Tables and uh, we construct also export and import weighted real exchange rates uh, that we combine with uh, three digit level data from ComTrack. We uh, looked into the uh, Penn World Tables. There has been some discussion about the levels. We're actually exploiting growth rates. I've been talking also with my colleague, Alberto Cavallo. They have been scraping websites all over the world and we checked uh, and in fact, I think he has a little paper on this. It actually, some of these data correlates well with some of the public data. Uh, since we're using growth rates, it makes us feel a little bit better about uh, some of this information, but that's how we're gonna measure uh, the PPP. We cross-check R&D data with the OECD innovation scoreboard. This is more information, but it has the limitation that is only for OECD countries. So uh, that is just, if you want also a, a sanity check. We use also real growth rates and inflation uh, from IMF. And we also, as a robustness check on currency composition of debt that we have compiled from the World Bank Enterprise Survey. This survey gives us data mostly for developing countries. Through the IDB, they have been very nice and they have data on a borrowing composition for Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and Colombia. So we also take that data. And uh, from Salomon Valera, they have been very nice and they, they share some of their summary statistics for Hungary. So again, we're trying to combine all of this information to try to derive stylized facts. Real exchange rates are endogenous. Full stop, we're not trying to argue anything different from that. They're endogenous to supply and demand shocks. Everyone knows this. However, we're looking at firms in the manufacturing sector. So what we're trying to argue is that we're gonna exploit the exogenous component in real exchange rates, and we're gonna look at the effects from individual firms. We do check, and none of our individual firms have a disproportional weight in GDPs. Again, we're only looking at a a manufacturing firms. So reverse causality is less likely. What might be more likely is omitted variable bias, and we do uh, many tests. One is we always control for some macro level variables, growth, inflation. We use trade weighted real exchange rates. This allows us to control for country time fixed effects. There is some interactions we also use uh, with status of the firm that allows us also to control for country sector time fixed effects. Uh, we use first period weights to deal with endogeneity, and we also try an IV strategy of exogenous shocks. So in a reduced form, we look at different outcome variables, revenue-based TFP growth rate uh, from value added from output, sales, cash flow, an indicator of R&D, and growth rate of export and entry. We look at the effect of real exchange rates on these variables. 
at the country time level, and as I said, we divide in three regions and uh, uh, do uh, add additional controls. So at a first pass, we find that uh, real exchange rates are positively related with TFP and cash flow and R&D and export probability in emerging Asia. If anything, for emerging markets, is negative and uh, not very significant results from industrialized countries. And as I said, we do many robustness to this analysis. So we started to think, okay, what can explain these differences? So we look at the a composition in terms of exports and imports. So Latin America, we tend to import a lot. And it turns out we find that in the data. We tend to relatively import more, and also our import intensity is higher not only relative to exports, but also relative to the other regions. And so we start looking into these differences and try to see if this explains some of the different results that we find. And so we uh, control for trade status. And so we control for whether the firm is exporting important. We also control uh, for whether the firm is multinational because they're more complex, as it was uh, uh, said yesterday in the talk. And once we control for trade status, we find that actually exporter firms tend to behave similar in the different regions. Um, for industrial countries, we don't find significant differences, but when we look at Asia and Latin America, we do find, and Eastern Europe, we do find that exporters sort of look similar and importers look similar. So again, so, so we think this uh, difference is more related to the import intensity and probability more than firms act differently. We also look at the role of financial constraints, and in the paper we showed that uh, R&D is related to cash flow, in particular in countries that have less developed financial markets, and we also control for foreign currency denomination <laughs> of debt. So from this we get, as I said, firms in emerging Asia tend to have uh, real exchange rate appreciations tend to associate it with faster revenue growth, productivity, sales, and higher product probability engage in R&D. In Latin America and Eastern Europe, in anything, negative results. Industrialized, we don't find significant effects. Exporters tend to be positively affected by real depreciation. Firms importing intermediates negatively. Firms in Asia are less likely to import, more likely to export, the opposite in, in Latin America. They also tend to be more constrained in terms of cash flow, and they also tend to borrow relatively less in foreign currency. So we take these stylized facts and we build a model, and I'm not gonna go into all the details. Uh, we're gonna do a small open economy. We're gonna focus on the manufacturing sector. So we're gonna put the main ingredients that we found. Uh, so we're gonna have a uh, productivity uh, part that is independent, but part that relates to R&D. And R&D decisions are gonna be subject to a sunk cost and a fixed cost. Firms are gonna be, um, financially constrained, and so they can only invest certain share of their profits in R&D. We're gonna assume that the real exchange rate uh, it has an AR1 process, that this is also we pick from the data. We're gonna assume that there are different uh, domestic and foreign goods, and firms self-selecting to exporting, importing, or, or being domestic, and that there's gonna be a difference in the quality of imported and foreign goods. So firms observe last period variables, then they observe the realizations of their fixed costs, then they invest in materials capital, whether to be importer or exporter, whether to invest in R&D, then they get the re second realization of the shock, and then uh, they produce. So we take our model, and uh, from the structural model, we can get an intuition of what is the elasticity of TFP to the exchange rate, and we decompose it in a part that we call the innovation channel, that this is related to the willingness and capacity to invest in R&D, that is related to market size, financial constraints, and we divide it into importing channel and the demanding channel. So we estimate a model, taking parameters from the literature and some of the demand and uh, production parameters we estimate from the data, this is just to give you a sense of what we do for the three regions. Uh, we find that some of the export import data matches very well. R&D data matches uh, somewhat 
the, the match is not uh, awful. Perhaps in R&D probability, the model uh, underestimates. And the elasticity, we always get the right sign, but we are uh, not matching exactly the magnitude. And we do this for emerging and industrialites. We differentiate the effects on the different channels. And then we take um, our model. And if you want, we play with different types of episodes. In particular, we start with a case of a 5% depreciation that is followed from for a sudden reappreciation. This appreciation is unanticipated. And what we find, and again, I, I don't have time to go in detail, is that these real exchange rate appreciations may have persistence effects in TFP that come because of these R&D decisions. So in emerging Asia, because a real exchange depreciation at the end gives you more profits that come from external demand, that compensate some of the costs associated to, with imports, they have more cash flow, they can invest more, and they have uh, these persistent R&D effects. In Latin America, and I'm not sure you can see these uh, figures, the opposite effect, again, related to these differences in export and import intensity. We also look and compare different uh, levels of depreciation and consistent with a lot of the trade literature, Krugman, Baldwin, we find that they're not linear, but they're also not asymmetric. So an appreciation doesn't give you the same results as uh, depreciation, and again, related to this some cost of uh, investment. And, and I think this is interesting because even yesterday was mentioned that now, for example, we don't see countries reacting to some of these real exchange rate movements the way we used to think about this. And we do it for emerging economies and industrialized. So we do many robustness checks. We, as I said, check for asymmetric depreciations and unappreciations. We look at the role of foreign currency borrowing. We test the, the, some of non, the effects on non-target moments. We test for the robustness of different parameters. So to conclude, real exchange rates uh, have effects that depend on different features of economies, but also firms, export orientation, dependence on imports, and financial development. We take this and we build it into a model to try to understand the real effects of changes in real exchange rate. We find that they're asymmetric and nonlinear with potential persistent effects. We are doing more robustness and more counterfactuals. Uh, but in terms of some of the future work, we don't talk about services. Uh, they're the main sector in most economies. It would be interesting to try to include them. As I said, given the way we set the model, we cannot tell you anything about welfare and thus policy implications, but we're thinking about it. Thank you very much. Laura, and our first discussant is Shang Jin Wei from Columbia University. Good morning. Uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss uh, this paper. And let me first find my discussion slides. Oh, it was open early. Someone closed it. All right. I can open it again. It's okay. So uh, Laura is very well known for her uh, careful study of a multi-country, large-scale uh, firm-level data. And, and we see uh, that in this uh, paper as uh, well. In addition, this paper also features a, a, a model that uh, guides uh, structural estimation uh, and uh, counterfactual experiments based on uh, 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 that. The, uh, you know, the paper has a very impressive uh, set of uh, micro uh, uh, multi-country uh, uh, firm, firm and plant level uh, 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 data that uh, Laura has uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, so I want to, uh, that's one of the uh, important contributions of the project. I want to highlight uh, that. Now, Laura started, or the paper started with uh, a following set of uh, data patterns that guides their search for uh, model and search for explanation. And the data pattern is, is heterogeneity in uh, trade response or firm response to real exchange rate movement in different sub regions. In particular, uh, in uh, East Asia, you find that the firm level innovation, R&D, productivity, and other variables uh, uh, respond positively to real exchange rate depreciation. A and B, but you find opposite patterns uh, in Latin America and, and Central Eastern Europe. Uh, 
B and C, you find no response, or no significant response in advanced countries. And uh, so that uh, uh, a set of evidence, a set of, uh, of a data pattern appears to be very robust in authors' uh, 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 ways of doing robustness checks. And then the rest of people are trying to see what kind of uh, things can explain uh, this and what kind of model can account for this uh, and, and what would be implication of uh, such a model that can, that can account for those uh, things. So the hypothesis that uh, uh, Laura and her co-authors propose is that um, essentially uh, the way I summarize it is, is, is two things. On the one hand, um, different features of a firm lead, will lead to a different res uh, exchange rate response. So export, exporting firms benefit from real exchange appreciation. Import intensive firms potentially can be hurt by uh, uh, real exchange uh, depreciation. So that's an example. Um, the second part is that firms in different subregions have different compositions of characteristics. That's why, on average, you see different uh, uh, responses. And the model, I mean, that's an example, but then you, they, they have other uh, firm features. For example, different propensity to borrow uh, in international capital market in foreign currency could also lead to different uh, real exchange rate uh, response. So those firms that have a lot of foreign currency uh, debt uh, may uh, get hurt by real exchange uh, depreciation. Do domestic currency value, but same amount of debt becomes uh, higher as ex exchange rate uh, depreciates. And if firms in different regions have different propensity to borrow in foreign currency, you can get different response uh, of firms in different regions to the same kind of a real exchange rate uh, um, shock. So the model is trying to account for this, and the calibration is, is based, it follows from that. So I, I have uh, five suggestions for Laura and her co-authors. The first suggestion is, uh, if, that's the, if that's the explanation, um, then one would imagine that the conditional um, explicitly accounting for the, those features in the uh, regression, then you should see regional dummies lose significance as something that should, uh, be, should be checked relatively easily. Um, um, and that uh, I think uh, it might be useful to see. We will get a sense about how, how uh, quantitatively important the set of a proposed explanation uh, is uh, in uh, accounting for regional uh, difference in the response. Uh, second uh, suggestion, uh, you know, which firms are exposed to, are open, are considered open and therefore exposed to exchange rate uh, movement. Currently, Laura and her co-authors uh, uh, classify all firms into three categories, those that do exports, those that do imports, and that those, those that do none of those uh, two. But in fact, firms that are currently classified as not doing exports and imports <laughs> may very well do do exports and imports uh, indirectly. And, and there are two types uh, of uh, indirect engagement with exports and uh, imports. Uh, one uh, is uh, what uh, JB and I and Ami Kandawe and I uh, referred to as uh, indirect exporters and ex uh, importers through trading firms. So, so uh, uh, in particular, in our uh, conceptualizations, uh, uh, there are firms that cannot afford to pay the fixed cost of doing direct exporting or direct importing, but they can you know, buy and sell through f other firms, larger trading firms that do exports, uh, uh, exports and imports uh, directly. So firms can engage in indirect exports and imports through, uh, through trading firms. Nonetheless, those firms, that even though they, uh, uh, they, their trading do not show up in the custom data, are not formally recorded as an exports and imports. Clearly, they, they will be affected by exchange movement uh, and, and other uh, trade exposure variables. The second type of indirect uh, trading, uh, indirect exporters and importers are firms uh, they are exposed to exports and imports uh, through supply chain perspective. So a recent uh, paper, uh, paper by Felix uh, Tintonot and co-authors uh, highlight uh, this. In other words, there are, you, know, you, can, you can have firms, you know, uh, Brazilian firms, Colombia firms, and so on, they don't export to the world, but they export to, but they, they sell their product to firms, which in turn do export to, uh, to the world market. Similarly, on the import side, I, don't, I may not buy from foreign firms, but I, but I buy from domestic firms that do buy from uh, uh, foreign firms through supply relationship. So that's a different second type of uh, uh, indirect trading, and those firms uh, clearly uh, uh, could be affected by exchange rate movement as, uh, as uh, well. Indeed, uh, uh, Tinto Not uh, and co-authors uh, uh, document once you account for indirect trading through supply chain perspective, in their Belgian example, most firms are in fact in that uh, uh, category. 
So, so therefore, the set of firms that are exposed to real exchange rate perhaps is bigger than what uh, uh, Laurel and co-authors are currently uh, uh, conceiving in their paper. Third uh, suggestion is about what is the real exchange rate, right? So you might think real exchange so so, so uh, 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 real exchange currently is measured in a uh, perhaps a standard way. You know, you look at nominal exchange rate adjusted by relative uh, uh, prices of the two. Uh, to uh, countries. That actually is not quite right. If you think about in, in the context of current the paper, if you, may, if you think of real exchange rate as a measure of something that affects firms' competitiveness, then you want to take into account uh, uh, supply chain structure uh, as uh, well. Uh, in, in, there are two senses in which the standard definition of real exchange rate is not quite right in the current context. Uh, first, at the aggregate the level. So imagine, let me, let me give a three country example. So suppose the only, so imagine a world with three countries, so China, Japan, and the US. The only trade that's taking place is, this, is that Japan exports intermediate goods to China, China bundle that with local value added and export to the US. Suppose that's the only trade you see. The correct effective exchange rate for China should assign negative weight to China-Japan trade positive weight to, uh, to the others. Why does this assign negative weight to, to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 Jap uh, Japanese uh, uh, variable? Because Japan is an input supply, so, so de depreciation of yen or appreciation of RMB relative to yen increases rather than reduces Chinese competitiveness. So that's, that's an example that shows that the supply chain perspective can potentially uh, uh, call for assigning negative sign to some uh, some trade flows. No standard definition of real exchange rate does it, but we know in this example that the uh, standard defini definition will not be right. But in, in general, uh, the supply chain uh, structure that we now observe through something like uh, inter-country input output tables uh, would uh, uh, generate a different set of uh, 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 weights, uh, call for a different way to construct real exchange rate. And I, and I have a paper that, uh, uh, one of several papers in recent, in recent uh, years that uh, 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 that uh, explain how one might be able to uh, construct a real exchange variable their way. Now, the same uh, supply chain perspective also suggests that uh, because different sectors in a given country participate in value uh, supply chain uh, structure differently, you automatically say that usually a country level real exchange will not be very useful. You want to go for a uh, country sector level uh, real exchange in order to properly account for uh, supply chain perspective. Uh, suggestion number four is about hysteresis. Now, the paper, uh, uh, Laura uh, did uh, uh, men uh, mention uh, uh, hysteresis uh, uh, literature, but somehow I think you're not taking the hysteresis hypothesis really seriously. So, so you, uh, cur Laura, uh, currently uh, uh, interpreted the hysteresis imp uh, implication as, as saying that you, you should expect to see asymmetric response of firm value variable to appreciation versus depreciation. My understanding of hysteresis uh, hypothesis goes beyond that. In fact, that the, 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 the key point of a hysteresis hypothesis is that given the existence of, of a, a sunk cost e in either exports or imports or in this con context of innovation, large shocks and small shocks will have very different uh, uh, responses. And the model should uh, it will explicitly account for this because the, 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 the key thing is it, it will generate uh, nonlinear responses in the extensive margins of the uh, variables, not, uh, not so much intensive margins. And, 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 and systematically, large shocks and small shocks will be different. So when you report comparative aesthetics, in fact, you want to separate uh, elasticity with respect to small shocks versus the large shocks. That's something that I didn't, I didn't see in your, OK. So, but, so maybe you didn't organize the presentation uh, uh, as uh, optimally. Uh, five, fifth and la la uh, last uh, suggestion is about uh, large versus small uh, 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 firms. The large firms, uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm citing a paper by um, uh, Amiti, so I'm missing a Y. Amiti, Sosky, and uh, Konings, uh, 2014 AER paper, paper that points out, uh, that points to the uh, observation that uh, uh, large firms are often large importers as well. Uh, uh, number one, and uh, number two, equally important, uh, large firms are likely to have large, large market uh, shares. Once model allows for variable markup, then you should expect systematically different uh, uh, responses, elasticities of large firm to a given real exchange rate shock than uh, smaller firms. So the combination of this, uh, both matters that the large firms are more likely to be simultaneously doing exports and imports, and large firms are likely to have 
a higher uh, a market share, market power, uh, both will lead to systematic differences in this. And since you're working with firm level data, uh, then the next, uh, that aspect probably should uh, take into account. So that, uh, so 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 here here's my set of uh, five uh, five uh, uh, suggestions. I don't need to read them. So thank you very much. <laughs>